Hello and welcome back to World 360. What are the consequences of the US Supreme Court's controversial verdict on Trump and a presidential immunity? Now that France's far right has surged in the first round of elections, what's next? And what's on Chinese President Xi Jinping's agenda as he travels to Central Asia? We answer this and more in today's episode. First up, the US Supreme Court. As you know, the US presidential elections are only months away. And Donald Trump, while contesting, has a slew of criminal cases against him. But earlier this week, the US Supreme Court issued a ruling in Trump's favor, though scholars and analysts say it could create disastrous precedents and even threatens the foundations of American democracy. We'll also talk a little bit about the composition of the Supreme Court and how it's dominated by conservative judges now. But first, let's look at what the verdict says. On 1st July, the US Supreme Court ruled that a former president has some immunity from criminal prosecution for official acts during his tenure in office. It deemed that when the president takes any action under the authority given to him by the Constitution, his authority is conclusive and preclusive, and therefore he cannot be prosecuted. However, that brings into question all kinds of things, such as could Trump order the military to assassinate one of his political opponents and enjoy immunity? It's a question a lot of constitutional experts are asking now. Let's also look at what one of the judges who voted nay on this judgment wrote. From this day forward, presidents of tomorrow will be free to exercise the commander-in-chief powers, the foreign affairs powers, and all the vast law enforcement powers enshrined in Article 2, however they please, including in ways that the Congress has deemed criminal and that have potentially grave consequences for the rights and liberties of Americans, said Justice Ketanji Brown-Jackson. Justice Jackson also said that a court must prevent presidents from becoming kings through case-by-case -case application and that this time she feels her colleagues on the court were wrong. US President Joe Biden, who is still reeling from a disastrous debate performance last week, criticized the Supreme Court's ruling on presidential immunity. At the outset of our nation, it was the character of George Washington, our first president, to find the presidency. He believed power was limited, not absolute. And that power always resides with the people, always. Now, over 200 years later, with today's Supreme Court decision, once again, it will depend on the character of the men and women who hold that presidency that are going to define the limits of the power of the presidency, because the law will no longer do it. I know I will respect the limits of the presidential powers I have for three and a half years. So in short, experts say this verdict broadens the ambit of presidential immunity and may protect Trump in future cases. Let's not forget that this case was with regard to whether Trump conspired to overturn the results of the 2020 presidential elections by spreading knowingly false claims of election fraud to obstruct the collecting, counting and certifying of the election results. He is also accused of meddling in the counting of votes in Georgia. As for the composition of the US Supreme Court, Conservative judges are in the majority. Let's not forget that this was the court that overturned the landmark Roe versus Wade judgment, and therefore changing abortion rights in America forever. For our second topic, we're looking at France's election in which the far right, led by Marine Le Pen, has made considerable gains in the first round of polls. Already, there are reports being written on what her foreign policy would look like vis-a-vis -vis Europe and Asia. Now that the first round is over, what's next? We have to remember that these are snap elections that French President Emmanuel Macron called for after his party's poor performance in the recently held EU parliamentary elections. And these snap elections are parliamentary elections, not the presidential one, which means it's a contest for seats in the lower house of France's parliament. There are 577 seats in France's National Assembly and Macron's ensemble alliance has about 244 seats. However, on Sunday, Marine Le Pen's National Rally, or RN Party, won big in the first round of the snap election, winning about 34% of the vote. New Popular Front coalition that includes centre-left, Greens and hard-left forces in France came in second. And President Emmanuel Macron's centrist alliance came in third. Since no party got 50% of the vote, another round of the election must be held on 7th July. Now, pollsters expect the far right to have the most seats in the National Assembly going forward, but it's unclear if they will be able to bag an absolute majority of 289 seats out of a total of 577. 
Macron will face a tough time if the far right win the parliamentary elections. In France, the National Assembly has the final say in the lawmaking process over the Senate, and the Senate is currently dominated by drum roll, please, the Conservatives. Though Macron's term only ends in 2027, a weakened French president would have ripple effects on Europe, which is currently facing an ongoing war in Ukraine. For our last topic, we're looking at Chinese President Xi Jinping's trip to Central Asia, where he is visiting Kazakhstan and Tajikistan for high-level talks. Before we get into what Xi Jinping's agenda is there, let's look at the broad picture. Russia's influence in Central Asia has been waning since the Ukraine war, and China seems to have used the advantage of global crises, be it COVID, the Taliban's return to power in Afghanistan, or the Russia-Ukraine war, to expand its influence in this region, which, as you know, is home to many former Soviet republics. So it's definitely a region that scholars are increasingly focusing on because it may prove to be a weak point in the partnership between China and Russia. Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping may have announced a no-limits partnership in the last few years, but could their overlapping interests in Central Asia cause some friction? Russia has traditionally been viewed by Central Asian countries as a security guarantor for internal stability and against external threats. But after the Ukraine war, Western sanctions on Russia forced these countries to look for alternative routes to export goods to the international market. And China has been very helpful in this regard. Clearly, Beijing is also eyeing the rare earths and lucrative critical minerals located in many of these Central Asian countries. Now, Carnegie did a very interesting analysis of this back in February, where one of the experts, Nargis Casanova, a senior fellow at Harvard Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies, said, The reality is more subtle and murky than either competition and rivalry or cooperation. It is a mix of the two. China and Russia cooperate where their interests overlap or partially overlap, and they compete where they don't overlap. In terms of overlapping interests, at least up until now, both countries were interested in stability in the region. Both were interested in the development of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization as an international multilateral organization that it is an alternative to the Western-led order. Now, back to Xi Jinping's visit to Central Asia. He's mainly there to attend the Shanghai Cooperation Summit or the SCO Summit in Kazakhstan, but he'll also pay a visit to neighboring Tajikistan. Let's not forget that Kazakhstan is where the Belt and Road Initiative or the BRI was proposed when Xi Jinping made an official visit to the country back in September 2013. A paragraph from the Chinese state's mouthpiece, Global Times, provides some insight into how China has been actively expanding its influence in Central Asia and why Xi Jinping's visit to the region is critical. All five Central Asian states are China's strategic partners. Among them, the China-Kazakhstan partnership has reached one of the highest levels of a permanent comprehensive strategic partnership, while China and Tajikistan have also established a comprehensive strategic partnership, read a recent report published by the Global Times. Agreements on more infrastructure connectivity projects could be reached during this visit, including the construction of the Trans-Caspian International Transport Route or the TITR, also known as the Middle Corridor. This would be an important transport corridor to sidestep goods traveling through sanctioned Russia. Thanks for watching. This is Pia Krishnkuti for The Print.